All right, hello guys, and welcome to today's um, today's show. Uh, first of all, uh, as as per usual, let's let's do a quick check that uh, sound quality is okay on your end. Please let me know if sound or video or anything at all is off with the stream. Um, after. After this, once people, if people tell me that everything is okay, I will not be, oh, whoops. I will not be checking, um, I will not be checking the, the sound or the video much throughout. So I'll just be keeping an eye on the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on Twitch chat as well as YouTube chat. So forget about it, says everything is fine. Lyrical Chess also. Hello to everyone. Hello to World Slinger, to our Lambricks. Uh, and I'll, I'll be moving around between Twitch and YouTube, so sorry if I miss anyone. Hello to uh, Recep, AR, Ramakrishna, Ayan Anthony, who calls me out on my lateness. Fair play. Hello to Suman. Uh, <laughs> you, do have a, you do have a point, Mr. Omar, Mark Cesari, and everybody else. So today what we're going to be talking about, uh, just a quick introduction. I'm uh, International Master Alex Astane, as you can see uh, over there. Uh, I'm a co-chess coach. Co-chess is a part of um, Chess24. It's a, a learning platform for basically anyone who is uh, thinking about anything relating to uh, coaching, uh, both individual and group coaching. Um, so with that out of the way, uh, let's talk. Let's begin to talk about what, what we came here for, which is uh, King and Pawn Endgames. Very first position that we have here is maybe one of the most important starting positions for anyone who wants to dive into the world of King, King and Pawn Endgames. And by the way, um, in my view, you cannot study Endgames, other types of Endgames, without knowing King and Pawn Endgames. So we're going to talk about that shortly after. But basically, um, very often, to find the right path in a Queen and Pawn Endgame, in a Knight Endgame, in a Rook and Two Knights Endgame, very often the right path can only be found if you understand the possible king and pawn endgames that that you could sort of transition to if that makes sense we'll show some examples of that uh shortly this is the very starting position here king and pawn against king um here's the question if it were white to play what is the evaluation if it were black to play what is the evaluation so i'll check the chat now Let me know, guys. So, if it's black, white wins. And if it's white, it's a draw is the answer from a couple of people um, on Twitch and also uh, where are the people on YouTube? On YouTube, I'm not getting the answers, um, but yeah, the people who, who answered are absolutely correct. Um, if it's white to play, it's going to be a draw. If it's black to play, it's going to be a win for white. Can anybody tell me why that is? Like if you had to, let's say you're explaining it to... I don't know, somebody who's newer to the game and they they ask you, hey, why is that? What would you say? So Maripant says opposition. Hello, Maripant, by the way. Um, and Oregon says opposition and Yagusa says opposition. And you know, you guys are right, um, but there's also, there's another way of answering it that is less common, and may, in my opinion, I'm going to try and make a case, is actually the more comprehensive way of answering, and it's with two words instead of opposition, and that is key squares. So what I'm going to try and argue is opposition is like, like a tool that you use, but key squares is the rule that you really need to, to know. So let's talk about key squares. In key, key squares, um, as one very uh, well-known coach, uh, Mark Dvoretsky, at least how he defined it, are those squares 
whose occupation by the king assures victory regardless of whose turn it is to move. And in the case of a pawn, in the case of most pawns, the key squares are the squares right here, uh, right here, where it's almost like a T shape. You've got your pawn, then you skip one row, and then it's the, the, the square here and the one to the left and to the right. So it's these three squares. And if we go back to the definition, key squares are those squares whose occupation by the king, in this case, the white king. So if the white king lands on any of these squares, uh, whose occupation by the king assures victory regardless of whose turn it is to move. So now we kind of, if we think about that, we can see why if it's black to play, it's going to be a lost position because if the black king moves, we are actually in this position, I set it up so it's white to play, so I can't do it. But if the black king moves here, we can see that white's king can land onto this key square on c6. If the black king moves to c7, the king goes to e6. So the way I look at this is white is leveraging the opposition to force black into to move to one side and then he'll occupy one of the key squares and going back to our definition that assures victory on the other hand if we go king to e5 now what are the key squares that we're trying to get to well it's either of these but black can use the opposition to prevent access to the key squares. so key squares is the end goal when you're trying to push forward a pawn, opposition is just a technique. Now let's talk about why it's very important to keep key squares in mind with some different, more complex examples. All right, sorry. So let me try to uh, show uh, some examples. Well, first of all, I'm gonna show, I'm gonna warm up, we're gonna warm up with a relatively simpler example. Okay. so. We're gonna thank you very much. We're gonna uh, we're gonna talk about this one here, and I'm gonna ask you what is the evaluation once again, same as before. What's the evaluation of this? Is white winning, or is it um, is it a draw? And also in both cases. So if it's black to play or if it's white to play, what's the evaluation? Uh, Itairap asks for coordinates. Uh, let me ask you guys a question. I can certainly put on coordinates, but I'll tell you why I don't do it. It's because if I put the coordinates, actually, maybe I can put them just like this. Sorry. Yeah, I can actually put them like this. So yes, <laughs> it's such a bad reason why I don't do it. I'm just going to straight up apologize to everyone uh, on both channels because it's not a good reason at all on, on my part. But I get a little OCD over this little bit of white here. This little bit of white because of it's <laughs> it's got like round edges, the board. So that's 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 really I, I'm gonna be told by people that it's a it's not a good excuse, and uh, and you guys would be right. It's not a it's not a very good excuse. But that's the reason. This little tip of white here. Um, <laughs> all right. So now we've got coordinates. Appreciate that. A tie wrap, you know, talking some sense into me. Uh, changing the board layout is not possible. Uh, so in this case, Dummy Legends, he is answering the question. He's saying you win in both cases. You're absolutely right. But here's a question, Dummy Legends, or anybody else who wants to field it. Didn't I say that in the case of most pawns, the key squares are t-shaped you skip a row and these are the t-shaped key squares so now all of a sudden we've got this position shouldn't it be a draw if it's white to play because if it's white to play and white wants to get onto one of the green squares if he goes here black is going to go here if he goes here black is going to go here and he's going to use the opposition to prevent access to those key squares so can anybody tell me why that is not the case and why indeed this position is winning with both colors with with both uh, sides to move
Hello to, to any, everybody uh, new, to uh, Aditya, to Srihari, to uh, Ayan, to Daniel, Alfredo. I think Alfredo Garcia is uh, maybe the, the only name I can do justice to. seems like a, a Spanish name, uh, but the rest, I apologize if I am mispronouncing. Hello to Anzil and Hamad and, and Kartik um, and Lupo and Harshit. <clears throat> so drunk chess says uh, i was just told king gets to the sixth before the pawn and then that's a win yeah you're absolutely right here's a more formal uh, explanation of this when it's about key squares it's the um the key squares in a position uh, are there's there's a new rule that we have to add to the to the rule of the key squares and it is this sorry let me just hmm, let me just delete all the highlights okay so here's the key here's the rule if you've got any pawn in your half of the board let's say you've got a pawn here then the key squares are indeed these three a hundred percent however if you've got your pawn into the enemy half you get a bonus you get a double up in that case once the pawn goes into the enemy half crosses the halfway mark then you've got six key squares instead so in this case if we apply that rule is our pawn in our half of the board or in theirs it's in theirs now that means we got our usual key squares but we also get that double up bonus in between row so now we've got these six key squares. Going back to the definition, what is a key square? It means when we get our king onto that square, does not matter whether it's white to move, black to move, doesn't matter, we're winning. So we know that this is gonna be a win. And we can actually play out that position and we can, we can check, uh, check that the theory holds true in every case. But here's another question. Where would you go in this position? Would you go king to a6, to c6, or does it matter, are you gonna convert Either way. So I'll check the chat now. Ashish says, hello, I played with you on Lee Chess before. I'm glad to hear that, Ashish. I hope it I hope the game I hope the game went my way. <laughs> Alfredo says you do great in Spanish. Well, I was born in Spain. I, uh, I, I, <laughs> I speak Spanish. It's my first language. So I would hope, would hope that I do okay in it. Um, it doesn't matter. Okay. People say it doesn't matter. You convert either way. Absolutely right. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You convert either way. Okay. So uh, let's just pick one at random. Let's go King C6 and I'm going to go mm, King here. And can somebody tell me how they would play? What, what's the next move? What would you play next? <clears throat> you would push the pawns, says Dummy Legends. King C7, says Cranky Monkey. B6, says Heduratito. So C7, says uh, Junk is not Junk. So different people have different uh feelings about this one um it's a it's close to 50 50 split between king c7 and b6 okay so let's say that i go b6 now this is one of the most important traps to be aware of in king and pawn endgames games because you're going to get this one for sure at some point in your chess career and you want to be aware of it both with white and black because here you can save a half a point with black if i go king a8 how are you going to make progress right so asherado says b7 okay so we go b7 and now i go king b8 And the problem is you have no move. You either play king b6 and you stalemate me or you move away with your king and you lose the pawn. 
So this is a super, super important trick. If you rush to push the pawn when it's a B pawn or a G pawn, you're going to draw against the best play. Now, if I went here, I would give up, give up the draw as black because now you can force the pawn home. But by going here, you use a very important stalemate trick, a kind of, I don't know, triangle is not quite the word, but you know, a kind of a pincer here on, on A8. I'm sure there's a better word, <laughs> but pincer, it'll have to do. So king is on A8 here and there's nothing to do. You're, you're sort of squeezing um, all the squares uh, away from the black king. And, if, and otherwise, if you push, there's that stalemate trick. So if we go back to this position, we said it didn't matter, but after king c6, king a7, some people said, why not go king c7? I'll go king a8, I have no other move. And now you notice, if I push the pawn, it's stalemate. So you have to go back, king b8. Now we're back to the starting position. So what's the trick? In fact, here, you have to go king a6 instead. Now there's no kind of pincering, because if you pincer me like this, this was the stalemate, um, stalemate situation, but uh, guess what? In this instance, you've got the whole board um, at your disposal. So, so in fact, uh, black can try. He can try to put his king here, b6, king here, b7, and he gets kicked out, and then king a7. So very, very important um, detail to be aware of. All right, next one. Okay, this position here, white to play. Can anybody take a guess? Is this winning? Is this a, a draw? This is a tricky one. Daniel Saul and Omar Abdin, Devs Rasti, Mark Cesari, they're all crushing it. Ayush, everybody's, literally everybody's crushing it with the right answer. White does win. Let's see if we've got on Twitch some non-believers. Sam Bratley is a non-believer. And uh, hello, Sam. And, and Biplav Subedi also saying it's a draw. Honestly, this one, the first time I saw it, I, I was not so clear. It's not so easy because the pawn is quite advanced. So let's remember what we, what we just covered about key squares. So if we want to win, we need to land our king on a key square. Now, important to note, black, the defending side, doesn't have to land their king on a key square. They just have to stop us from getting onto a key square. That's the difference. So can somebody tell me what are the key squares in this position? There are three. A, B, and C6. Absolutely. These are your key squares. So you have to go to them. Now, people have said so far, and maybe I've missed uh, somebody who answered specifically, but most people have said white is winning. But I haven't seen too much by way of how would you win? What, what, what are you going to do? What's your plan here? Okay, somebody actually did answer this. Um, but let's see if more people join in.
So people are saying king to a4, not c4. Absolutely. King goes to c2, to b3, to a4. Very good. Well done. A lot of people know this, know this trick. This is the way to go. But here's, here's one, one way that I like to think about this problem. So we know somebody's asking, why are these key squares? Well, it's, it's simply like key square theory. Uh, basically, people have realized by working it all out that there's a theory that holds together, you know, let's say the, the, the truth of, of, of king and pawn endgames, which is if white can get his king to one of these uh, squares, basically uh, you skip one row and then you select this one and then to the left and to the right, so it's T-shaped. And they've worked out that in the case of any pawn in your half of the board, except flank pawns, rook pawns, um, this theory holds true. If you get your king here, you can force a win, uh, unless, of course, black's king is over here and can take your pawn. And then they also worked out that if you push your pawn into uh, the opponent's side of the board, then you actually get an extra row of squares over here. So if this pawn lands here, you would keep your original row and you've got, like, you double up. So that's key square theory. And... Um, and in this case, you've got these three squares over here. You need to get to one of them. And here's the question. What does black want to do? Well, black wants to prevent you from getting into these. That's what he wants to do. So he probably wants to find himself over here or here, you know, one of these squares to stop you from getting to them. A question that I've asked students before is I've asked them which of these squares is more valuable. And it's a trick question. The answer is they're all worth the same. It's like if I say to you, if I show you three hundred dollar bills and I say to you which one is worth more, they're all worth the same. So the one you should chase after is this one. And the reason is because if you look at it, you've one, two, three, four, five moves away from here. You're one, two, three, four, five moves away from all of them. But for black, that's not the case. Black is one, two, three away from this one, four away from that one, and five from this one. So always, whenever you're hunting down a key square, always chase after the square that is furthest away from the defending side. That's a6, and then you can come up with your answer, king c2. You start to calculate king c2, black goes king e7, king b3, black approaches, king here, black approaches, and now where do you go? Do you go to a5 or do you go to b5? Yeah, so people are saying a5, otherwise it's a draw. Why? Because if you go to b5, you're threatening access to this key square here. By the rule, these are the key squares. You're threatening access, but black can go king b7 using the technique, the opposition, to prevent access to all of the key squares. And he can keep doing that forever. If you push the pawn, what are your key squares now? You've got the same T-shaped row, but now you're in your opponent's half of the board, so you've got this double up here. That means if you land your king to any of these squares, you're going to win. Problem is, black's king is really well placed, and your king usually wants to be in front of the pawn, and it's just not there. You can start pushing, king goes back in front of the pawn, preparing to use the opposition against you to hold you off. If you push, the stalemate trick will decide the game. So, um, therefore, in the game instead, it goes king c2, king e7, king b3, king here, king here. The hunt is on for the key squares. King c7, little trick from black. If he had gone here, it made it impossible to go wrong. But he does set a little trick. We sidestep it using what's known as the diagonal opposition. And now, what is our threat? Our threat is to land here because that's the key square, one of the key squares. Black has to stop the threat, king b7. White goes king b5. Now, black has to move, and whichever way he moves, white will grab one of the key squares, and it's game over. If white goes here, king goes here, king goes here, pawn push, king goes here, and remember, what's the trick that you would not want to play here? What's the one move that would allow black to 
escape with a draw. What's that move that we just learned to not play unless... No, in fact, under no conditions will you play it. We will not be bullied into playing b6 under any conditions. Absolutely right. b6, king a8, and king c7 is a nasty stalemate trick. So instead we go king c7, king here, whip the king back to b6, over to a6, and then we push the pawn. And we are very, very... Uh, generous with the amount of space we leave uh, for the king, right? So in this case, we're absolutely happy to be generous. So that is uh, another more complicated example of key squares, but hopefully it was instructive and, and sort of entertaining. Okay, here's another position. White to play. Is this, uh, is this a draw? Is white winning or is white... Um, losing thank you appreciate that dummy legends mike my country mark anzil i'm glad that uh you guys are getting value out of this I, I i really believe like that this fundamental king and pawn stuff is right up there in terms of like some of the most important things that you can do to just like improve your results and and both in the short medium and, and long long run so people are saying it's a draw uh some people are saying it's winning for white some people are saying it's losing for white so um in fact <clears throat> let's think about this I think that the people who are saying it's winning for white, I'm just going to take a guess, are thinking white actually can push forward, right? And maybe grab this pawn. If he could do that, of course, he'd be winning. But he's too slow. In fact, in this position, the only side that might have winning chances at first glance would be black. The reason is because black's king is much, much better placed than white's king. Black's king is... If you, if you look relative to his pawn, is way out in front, whereas white's king is way behind the pawn. So we know king in front of the pawn is usually the more active king, what we want. So in this case, black's king is better. So if anyone's going to win, it's probably going to be black. If you attempt to go running like this, black is just way too quick and he grabs the pawn. Now, <clears throat> the, the reason some people are saying that white is losing is because I think they've worked out the fact that if white tries to hold off the black king, sooner or later, this pawn will fall. There's nothing you can do to prevent it. For example, if I go here, king here, king here, king goes to e4, and you can see the pawn is dropping. However, this is a draw. Harish is absolutely right. Uh, Gagdad is right. Hobodog White gives up the pawn, but gets opposition, so it's a draw. So a lot of people are saying, um, is this not a draw? You guys are correct. The reason is, you lose the pawn, but where do you go now with your king? You go to c3, only move to go to c3. And the reason for that is because when the pawn drops, you have to be prepared to jump to d3, using the opposition, the technique, the tool, to prevent access to the key squares, right? Because in this position, we're looking at it from black's perspective, which makes it a little bit harder to, to visualize, but these are the key squares. It's the same T-shape. We have to now, as the defending king, we have to prevent access to the key square. We use opposition to do that. We keep doing that. Black's king cannot make any progress. You push the pawn. Pawn is still in black's half of the board. So the key squares are still these ones. What would be a losing move in this instance? Well, for example, if we were to go here, now in this situation, we see that black could advance 
sorry, could advance. And now the key squares have to be guarded. So we have only one move that guards. So there we go to, to D2. Then he uses opposition. Now the key squares have to be guarded, but we're split too thin here. We cannot cover them both. So whether we go to the right or to the left, he'll take the other one and he wins. So we have to go back. And here we have to follow the rule of staying behind the pawn. Now there's no access to these squares. Black can't make progress with his king, so he pushes his pawn. He moves forward. We stay always behind the pawn. He moves forward. We take the opposition to just control as many forward squares as possible. He can keep pushing, but again, the rule of stalemate saves the day. So this is a position that has been resigned in the past by some quite strong players just thinking I'm going to lose my pawn so therefore I'm going to lose the game by the way there is a there is a rule can somebody tell me for example let's say that I get uh let's say I don't know position like this um let's say something like that so can somebody tell me who wins? It's black to play. Um, does the pawn on d5 fall or not? So it's black to play. Is he going to have a chance to win this pawn? Or does white have instead a chance to win this pawn? Uh, or is neither side going to be able to win the other guy's pawn? Do we know any rule here? So people are saying neither. Okay. Nope. Okay. So people are saying that black cannot win the d5 pawn. So let's see. Let's see if that is true or not. I'm going to go king g5. Now, where do you guys want to go? Yeah, Yugusa says black will win the pawn, but if white has king to d3, it's a draw. David Sanders says he wins it. Right, so there's two rules that I want to talk about here that are helpful. Um, one question some people might be saying is, wait, wait a second, why does he win it? Like, isn't white just going to push forward? Then king goes forward, and now I'm going to push forward, and if you approach me to try and take me, I'm going to go here... And what you're going to get is you're going to get this situation where, in fact, it's like a, we call this a mutual zugzwang. Um, because whichever side is to move will lose their pawn. And in this case, it's black to move. So it's looking good for us. But of course, that's not true because in this position, uh, Drunk Chess is saying if black plays king e5, white indeed can play king c6. That part is true. But what can black do instead? Yes, David Sanders and Anirud uh, uh, Barbe. He will just go to e4. He goes to e4, forcing us to, or not forcing, but inviting us to go to c6. And only now, king e5, he gets the same position. And the reason that works in his favor is because Black is the first person with the right to attack our pawn. He gets there first. So it's no surprise he's got a little trick up his sleeve and he's able to he's able to hit this pawn in a way, in a clever way, where if we advance, he's the one that gets the mutual uh, zugzwang. If, on the other hand, we defend like this, we draw. We lose the pawn, but we draw. Why? Because after king here, king takes, we take the opposition, to prevent access to the, any of the key squares. So, in fact, black is going to win the pawn. Here is a very little known trick. In, the, in this case, we're going to introduce a new rule. In this case, 
The key squares rule doesn't apply because both sides have a pawn. In a situation where pawns are locked, locked pawns like this, one side has each pawn. If you want to figure out very quickly the answer to uh, does the pawn fall or does it not, there's a rule that in my, in my experience as a coach, the majority of students are not uh, familiar with it. And here's the rule. Um, there's a, a, a nice like Russian, old Russian book that calls it critical squares. So the rule is the pawn will fall if the more advanced king, notice this is the more advanced king. Why? Because I'm on the same horizontal as my pawn, whereas you're, you're, not, you're not there. You're actually, you're not even one row behind, you're two. So the more advanced king, if it can get to any of these squares, that's three squares to each side of the pawn. If the king lands there, the pawn will fall. And this is, uh, this is the rule. I don't know how many authors have talked about this. I read it in, a, in an old uh, Soviet uh, chess book. But it's true. You can check if you don't believe it. Uh, you can check different situations. And here, the other uh, important rule is this concept of a mind square, uh, where if the king goes here, these are corresponding squares. If the king goes here, then... Uh, corresponding squares relate to squares where uh, opposition is in play. So this would be mutual opposition. And if you uh, lose, uh, if, if, you, if you're in a situation of mutual opposition, you don't want it to be your move. It's a rare exception in chess where you don't want it to be your move. In chess, most of the time you want it to be your move, but not here. Uh, so when you recognize these are the mind squares, you attack in a crafty different way. You force your opponent's hand and then you get the uh, the mind squares in your favor. White would be wise to go here and play for it. Sorry, play for a draw instead. And he can get it because of the opposition preventing key square access. Okay. Hopefully that was more or less clear. It's a lot to take in. Um, I understand. Uh, okay. Here's a straight, more straightforward one. Oh, no, no, this is not a straightforward one. Sorry. So this one is a little bit tricky. Can anybody tell me... Anybody can tell me about this one. Uh, white to play. What is the evaluation? This is a quite a famous puzzle, so some people might have seen it before. Yeah. Mr. Dvoretsky... Uh, he he talked about this. For anyone who doesn't know who Mark Dvoretsky is, he, he died a few years ago, but he was widely regarded as one of the... He is widely regarded as one of the, the, the best coaches of, of the last few decades. Yeah, so... Uh, Winning, but many would draw. <laughs> I think drunk chess is uh, is very. That's a very sober comment from drunk chess. Um, I think it's on the money because the thing about it is, you know, you want to push after you. You want to um, go after this pawn, but it's quite tricky. Uh, you can chase after it, <coughs> but if we go here, I might play the move h four. And then what would you do? H3 is dirty, says David Sanders. Yeah, a lot of people are saying like a move like King F3. Some people are saying a draw. Mighty Chef knows his stuff. Napoleon also. Uh, very, very nice. King G1 is actually the solution. Uh, if you go King F3, though, the problem is black goes H3. This is the, the very dirty move that black has at his disposal. Now, if you don't take the pawn, you're going to be too slow by the time that you round up the pawn. 
right? So for example, say you go g3, and I approach with my king. Now you cannot go forward because my pawn will run, so you have to shimmy back around to h2. And now you can see that I'm going to get there and I'm going to be the defending the pawn. And even if I didn't, even if I just stuck here, my king is so well placed that you will never get to one of the three key squares. So that's too slow. If on the other hand, I play g4, I will be able to get my king to g3. But notice that what will happen here is that the black king is a little bit too fast. If I could land my king here, it would be a different story. I would win. But I'm just one move too slow. Black blocks the door and there's nothing to be done. I cannot make progress with my king, so I have to start pushing my pawn. And then we're back to this same situation that we've seen um, probably in our own games uh, a bunch of times and certainly today um, where the stalemate rule saves the day. So um, therefore, after king f3, black's clever trick of h3 saves the day. Well, we haven't checked what happens if pawn takes h3. Here's the question. After I take this pawn on h3, what are my key squares? So, so some people might have been um, might not have joined immediately. Um, for those who have been here from the start, I'll, I'll I'll just very very quickly explain. You guys can check out check out the stream again um, if you're not sure about key squares after this super quick uh, re-explanation. Basically, key squares are uh, it's a theory where people have worked out what are the squares where if one side has a pawn and the other side doesn't. What are, the, what are the squares that the side with the pawn should put his king on um, in order to guarantee a win, no matter whether it's white to play, black to play. They'll guarantee a win. And the basic rule is for most pawns, it's going to be just a T-shape. So it's going to be these three squares skipping a row. And eventually, you push your pawn forward, and the rule changes um, when the pawn pushes forward into the opponent's half of the board. So if we have, for example, a pawn here, the rule is suddenly different. The rule is that not only do you keep your T-shape, but you also double up. You get this bonus row. So your king on any of the blue squares here will guarantee a win, regardless of whose move it is. Um, so that's key square theory in a nutshell. But we have an exception, and we're just arriving at that exception. And that is the key squares for uh, rook pawns. When you have an extra pawn, like here, but it's a rook's pawn. Because the problem is, uh, you know, people are tr gonna try to draw the T-shape in their mind, probably. You're probably looking at this and it's like, okay, Alex has been talking about a T-shape here, so let me draw that T-shape. But the problem, the problem is that unless you, you, you know, have impressive powers of imagination, you, you know, you're not gonna be able to draw the T-shape because there's no I file. So it ends at the h file. So the rules change for rook's pawns. They have to change. And they worked it out and they realized this is the key square. This is where you want to get to, the, or the equivalent, depending on which pawn. Some authors, uh, the Beretsky included, they, they add this one. But for me, I think it doesn't really matter to add that one or not, because if you can get here, then it's always going to be possible for you to get to that one, to g8. So it's kind of the same thing. And the reason I like to teach, uh, I like to teach this one, I like to emphasize just one, is because the last thing that you want is the last thing that you want is to choose this one. And let's say, let, let me just, let me show that. Uh, sorry, I need to enter move mode. So the last thing that you want is to find yourself in this kind of a situation, right? where let's say you've got this position and then let's say king here so you're in this position and you could choose between one of these uh two key squares here but you've learned uh either one wins and you push to this one 
And so you go ahead, you push to this one, king goes forward, and you start to run the pawn. But the problem that you run into is that black can actually hunt down your pawn. If we go back and we put our king on the more sensible, more central square, and black tries to chase after our pawn, well, the king is in time to save it. So that's why I like to teach technically both squares are key squares. Um, but I like to teach just this one because it's not, it's, it's never going to get you into trouble. The other one might get you into some trouble. Um, so this is actually a draw because we know <clears throat> that over here are the key squares and we know that black doesn't even need to step into them. He just needs to cover them. So for example, um, for example, let's say king goes here, king goes here, king goes here, king goes here. King goes here, king goes here. Now, what most people would do, myself included, is they'd just go to the corner and they'd sit and wait. And many people have been taught king and pawn endgames like just he who gets to the corner, if you can get your king to the corner, you draw. But it's actually a little bit different. In fact, in this instance, all you need to think about is control the key squares. So, as black, Am I controlling the key squares? Yes. I don't have the corner, but I am controlling the key squares. So you push your pawn, still controlling the key squares. You push your pawn, still controlling the key squares. You push, still controlling, still controlling. And a funky sideways stalemate trick saves the day. So now I stalemate white rather than stalemate myself, and it's a draw. So notice how my defense of controlling the key squares without necessarily stepping onto them was enough. Let's say that white says, I don't like that, I'm going to go here. Now remember, the key squares we need to focus on are these. So in this case, if I push the king away, he will take over. So I must go here. And after h7, now I'm the one that gets stalemated. And after here, we simply uh, we simply go here. Okay, so that is the the trickiness of this particular endgame. So after King F two H four, some people got it in the chat that you cannot push forward because of this trick, but instead you should go backwards King G one and approach the pawn this way. Now. Do I get there in time if I defend? Well, let's see. Let's do the counting method. One move, two moves, or sorry, um, I take one, two, three, four moves to defend the pawn, and he takes one, two, and on the third he'll take it. So we're gonna, we can't, we're, we're too, we're too late. He takes on the third, and we need four moves in order to defend it. We can play that out if we're not clear. Like king goes here, king goes here, king goes here, king here. And you can see we're just one tempo away. And that, by the way, was the importance in this starting position to start with king f2. If people wanted to start with king g1, the problem here is now what are we? We're one, two, three, and on the fourth we'll defend. Whereas here, we're one, two, three, and on the fourth we'll take it. So that's four and four, and, uh, and it's a draw. Okay. So, king f2, sorry guys, uh, king f2, h4, king g1. And now, since I know, I, I'm going to play h3. What would you do here? Uh, Rune asks, what's a good endgame book you'd recommend? I mean, one very, very popular book amongst a lot of, um, a lot of my, my students and this, and I'm, I don't get a cut or anything like that, but it's Chessable's uh, 100 Endgames You Must Know. Um, that's one that I've just heard a lot of my students really enjoyed, not just enjoyed the results uh, of it, um, but they enjoyed the process of actually going through it. Uh, everybody is nailing this one. Um, by the way, with uh, with G three, 
uh, Drunk Chess is making a, <laughs> a, a confession that the first time he saw this, he failed with g4. It's very tempting to play g4, but if you have, if you know key squares, if, uh, uh, if, you, if you understand key squares, you will play g3 without calculating. And the reason is this. If we put a pawn on g3, where, the, sorry, let's say, excuse me, if we put a pawn on g4, what are the key squares that we have to get the king on? Thank you for the subscription, by the way, to uh, Dweeby. It's appreciated. What are the key squares? It's that T shape. We're still in our half of the board, which means there's only going to be three key squares. F, G, and H, 6. Correct to Dummy Legends, Benjamin, and, and a few others. So it's these three key squares. Now, what's the, what's the, um, what's the battle here? The battle, the battle in play, it's like, it's like one of those uh, documentaries, nature documentaries. It's the, the lion and the gazelle, and they're, you know, the, the, the gazelle is trying to escape, the lion is trying to hunt it. And it's kind of like this, in this case, well, the gazelle would, and this is a terrible comparison, guys. Can we just, you know, pretend the last 15 seconds didn't happen? That would be great. I should stick to the chess and less to the, the gazelle analogies. Because in this case, it would be a very brave gazelle that actually moves towards the lion. Um, and, and the point is to block to block these particular squares. So it might be more like a lion versus some kind of, I don't know, elephant or something. You know, something where we're, we're talking about, um, yeah, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna, sorry guys. I'm gonna stop with this, uh, the comparisons. The point is the king moves forward to block. The white king moves forward to try to get into one of those key squares. It's not possible. Um, in this case, for, for white, because when the king moves forward, sorry, when the king moves forward, king goes over, King moves forward again, king takes, king goes over, king here, and we get there just in time. It's much more likely, even before calculating, it's much more likely that we're going to uh, win the race if we put our pawn closer, because if we put our pawn closer, these are the key squares. So we can choose the red key squares to, to, have, to chase down, or the green key squares. So we can see, obviously, the green key squares are going to be further from us, from our king, and nearer from theirs. So we want to stack the odds in our favor. So g3, king d7, king here, king over here, king takes, king f6, and now what, what move, uh, what move uh, would you play? <laughs> Lion versus bicycle. Yeah, I feel like people are not... Uh... They're not taking my my uh, my metaphor seriously. Yeah, so King H4, everybody everybody correct. Uh, King H4, using the diagonal opposition to hunt down this particular square on H5. Black says I have to control the key square. White says I use opposition again, forcing you to make a decision. Whether you go to the left, I'm going to take a key square here. Whether you go to the right, I'm going to take a key square here. And if anybody is skeptical that that you're guaranteed a win, you can just play it out. Uh, you can check with computers, or you can always just play it out and see. Play the black side and see, can you can you find the defense? And, and you'll find that, that there is none against best play from white. So um, that's a really beautiful one. Uh, I love this puzzle because it's extremely simple, but it teaches a bunch of different uh, things that are very important for good king and pawn endgame play. The first thing it teaches is it teaches the counting method. If you go uh, if you look at this position, you say one move, two moves, three moves, and on the fourth I can take, and black is one move, two moves, three moves, and then the fourth he can defend. So we've got 4-4, four, four, but the rule is because it's white to play, he's going to be the one who actually just gets there in time, if it's an equal number. But if we know that we just get there by one move, if we go the shortest route, we can use the process of elimination to not calculate anything else. We, we do not have to spend any time on any other move because we know that the fastest way f to the pawn just gets us there in the nick of time. So process of elimination, we can make the decision to go king f2. Black uses the same theory, knows he won't get to the pawn, and he says, well, let's imagine I get my king here and white takes the pawn. 
will I be losing? And then he looks at key square theory and he says, well, key squares for a pawn on g2 are these. And if the black white king ends up here, he can always slot the king into a key square. Or he, what he could also do is he could just move the pawn forward by one square, shifting the key squares forward, and he's already on one of those key squares. So both players, if they know key square theory, they'll understand that's going to be a win. And notice, by the way, what I said at the start of the uh, lesson, I said, if you rely only on opposition and not on key square theory, in the simple examples, that's going to help you out and it's going to save the day for you. But in more complex examples like this one, it might be tricky for you to work out whether it's a win or whether it's a draw, if you're only thinking in terms of opposition. So king goes to f2, and now black relies on h4, because he knows that if he can shift the pawn to the h file, the key squares will be here, and he stacks the odds in his favor to drive over, not to necessarily get in onto a key square, as long as he stops the white king from landing on one, that'll be good enough. White now steps backwards, and because he's provoked the pawn forward one square, making it impossible for black's king to defend. Now black knows that, using the counting method as before, so he pushes, still hoping that we've got an h-pawn, um, which would give him a chance to hold the draw by accessing the key squares or blocking access to the key squares over here. White doesn't push forward like the normal human desire, get the maximum push uh, in any position, the most active move, because he reasons there's no benefit to me getting these key squares over here to have to fight for. I'd much rather fight, I'd much rather stack the odds in my favor. I don't even need to calculate. I know there's no downside ever. Sorry. Um, I know there's never going to be a downside to making the key squares closer to me. So I'll keep them closer. Black now uh, makes the races on, basically. The race is on. Black sets one little trick. He goes here. He doesn't go here. He goes here, hoping white will go to g4. Then he could use the opposition to deny access to all three key squares. But black sidesteps that using diagonal opposition. Black goes to g6 and now direct opposition. One of these squares is going to drop and uh, with it the game. Now we can see that familiar T shape. White is on a key square and it's game over. And you can play this out. One very last trick in this position would be, uh, sorry, in this case, here, let's say, would be uh, king here, king to g8. Now, if you were to push the pawn, king here, and that stalemate trick we saw at the start of the lesson would apply. We know to sidestep that. We saw it from this side of the board where the king went to a6, so by, we reason that here the king has to go over to h6. We bring the king over, king here. Now there's no stalemate trap. Uh, sorry, sorry, I gave myself the stalemate trap. <laughs> what am I saying? What am I saying? Sorry. Once the king goes here, now we go here. We go with a check. I'm really losing it. We go with a check here, king here, and now we uh, promote. But the stalemate trap that I was talking about uh, to keep you guys uh, honest, would be, um, yeah, king here, pawn here, king here, and this one. Because when the king goes to f7, there is a stalemate here. And if the pawn goes to g7, king here, there is king g6. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to actually, after the, <laughs> after the very last blunder myself there, I'm going to go ahead and rewatch this lesson. But I hope you guys uh, enjoyed enjoyed this class um this is part of a show uh, brought to you uh, by a bunch of different coaches uh, coaches for those who are maybe interested in uh, coaching either individual or group uh, lessons there's a lot of stuff going on uh, over at coaches.com there's um, at the moment three major shows being put on by coaches that are instructive there's one with uh, one of our premium coaches uh Raluca um, Skircha, she is on on Tuesdays, I believe at three o'clock Central European time most weeks. 
and she does a range of stuff with a student uh, of hers. We've got Kostya Kavutsky. Some of you might know him from Chess Dojo. He's got a new show, Episode 1, uh, very uh, US-friendly times. Episode 1 aired just uh, yesterday, I believe it was. And it's called Diagnose Your Chess. And it's going to be a weekly show every Thursday, uh, very late Thursday, actually. So it's every Thursday at um, 5 or 6 p.m., uh, like Central Time uh, American. I'd have to, you'd have to double check that, but you guys can go on to Chess24 and see the, one of the recent videos. Um, he basically is selecting different students of his uh, for a one hour lesson or non students, but like people who want to learn. Like they might not be regular students of his and he's doing a one hour, like one hour to 90 minute interactive lesson with them. So that's worth a watch. And um, and finally, there's Level Up Your Chess where, uh, yeah, today it was it was me. Um, and it's it's been it's been a mix sometimes of the, the premium coaches on, on Coach Chess have done some of these Level Up Your Chess, uh, like myself and, and Mihailo Oleksienko. Um, and then uh, sometimes it's it's newer faces as well. So every week it's uh, it's a different face. Uh, for now, and uh, and different topics. So I hope you've enjoyed today, and uh, certainly hope you'll tune in to more of Level Up Your Chess. It's the same time every week, uh, Saturday at three o'clock Central European time. Um, just to answer a couple more questions, people are saying um, that they appreciated it, that it was instructive. Very much, um, glad, really glad to hear that. Um, some people. I say that King and Pawn Endgames can be a little bit boring. Um, I don't personally find that, so I, I, I hope that uh, I hope that uh, you guys also felt that they they can be enjoyable. They can be quite quite pretty, actually. The the different concepts uh, and the logic of Endgames, and also more importantly, I hope that you guys uh, go out into the battlefield and um, and win some games or even draw some games from from losing positions or hold draw games that you previously would have lost as a result of this newly gained knowledge. Um, so that is it. Indeed, David Sanders has lots of harmony in the pieces in endgames. I agree with that. Um, and yeah, thank you to, to everyone uh, for, for the kind words. And um, well, I will see you guys uh, again every once in a while uh, for sure. I'm putting out some content, whether on Chess24 or on various other channels, including uh, my own, although I'm not too active for now. So, um, all right. See you guys again. And um, uh, thanks, for, for, thanks for joining.